Hello and welcome to Project Oneness World. Today we are in conversation with Professor Suleiman Hawamde. He's a Regents Professor in the Department of Information Science, College of Information, University of North Texas. Professor Hawamde is a leading authority in the field of knowledge management and the Editor-in-Chief of the Journal of Information and Knowledge Management. He founded and directed several academic programs, including the first uh, Master of Science in Knowledge Management in Asia, in the School of Communication and Information at NTU, Nanyang Technological University in Singapore, and the Master of Science in Data Science at the University of North Texas. Uh, Professor Vamde uh, may not remember, but when I, when I was an undergraduate computer engineering student at NTU, uh, I was there from 1995 to 1999, and I remember uh, seeing your name and your picture on the faculty board. And also, I think vaguely, vaguely recall seeing you on campus at that time. And uh, you, of course, would not remember because uh, I was one of countless students at that point. Uh, and when you go to the, go to Professor Hawamde's website, hawamde.net, uh, you see the book covers of 14 books uh, that are either authored or edited uh, by him. So these are in the areas of knowledge management, information science, data analytics, cybersecurity, and knowledge governance. His CV has a really long list of research publications. Uh, as per Google Scholar, his research has been cited more than 3,000 times. He has held various positions, including uh, being a department chair and director of the PhD program in information science. He has extensive industrial and consulting experience. He has been the chair, founding chair, and president of several professional associations and conferences, including the ICKM, which is the International Conference on Knowledge Management. And I've had the honor of working with him as part of the ICKM team over the past few years. And he has received various uh, awards and honors. Uh, in 2020, he received the Alice Award for Professional Contribution in Library and Information Science Education. Uh, Alice is the Association for Library and Information Science Education. And the same year, uh, he was recognized as a distinguished member by ACIST, uh, the Association for Information Science and Technology. In 2022, he was recognized by the University of North Texas as a Regents Professor, which is a recognition for faculty at the rank of professor uh, who has performed outstanding uh, teaching, research, and service to the profession and uh, who has achieved a high level of national and international recognition. So welcome, Professor Hawamde. And- uh, Thank you, glad to be here. Thank you. And so to begin with, uh, maybe we can start with uh, you telling your story in your own words. Well, it's a, it's a long journey that took us sort of different places around the world. Uh, as you mentioned, who was in uh, Singapore at NTU. And uh, I grew up in a sort of a small town um, where I have initially first I have to walk to the school for about almost two miles every day, uh, which was good, kept me fit. But, <laughs> but then uh, for secondary school, I have to go to another town, I actually take the bus every day to go to the town. So can you also mention the names of the towns as you... As yeah, it was in uh, Hebron, um, in West Bank. I grew up in uh, Samoa, which is a small town to the south of Hebron, which is about 20 miles from uh, Hebron. Uh, so I had to uh, take the bus and go to the school. Um, then I went to uh, Birzeit University, which is in Ramallah, in West, in West Bank. Uh, uh, and... Uh, I did my first degree in physics uh, during working in the uh, university. I worked in the library um, largely because I like libraries and like books and I feel very comfortable around books in general. Right. Um, so I worked as a student in the library where I um, manned the library after office hours. So if I, Librarians would go home and I take over and run the library. It was very enjoyable. <laughs> right. uh, uh, so uh, when I uh, finished my first degree in physics, I um, first went to teach as a physics teacher. Uh, but then uh, I had an opportunity to uh, go back to the same university and work in the library, uh, basically manage the science and engineering uh, branch of the uh, uh, university library, uh, and during the during that period, uh, 
automation of libraries started, uh, basically um, <clears throat> using computers in library. And that's something fascinated me. Um, and I thought that, uh, you know, something that is, I have interest in uh, coming from physics background. I did a couple of uh, programming courses in computer and had interest in computer at that time. Uh, the university has a, a HP mini frame computers that they were using it to automate the library. And which languages did you learn? The, which programming languages at that point? And at that time, PL1, which is a very old language. At that and, and, and which year was it? And what, th th this was in 1980, okay. 81. Okay. So I worked in the library and I got the opportunity to get a, a awarded a scholarship from MED East, which is the American Middle East Educational Agency, um, to go to University of Michigan and do a um, master in library science. And the story behind that is that uh, the library automation were not going very well. And the Dean of Arts and Science is taught, I'm an expert in libraries. For the fact that I used to open and close the library at night, right. I I do have interest in libraries, but I'm not really an expert. But he thought if I would go and do a master in library science and come back, I will fix the automation problem that was that wasn't going very well. Um, so I I said, well, if I get a scholarship, I'll do it. So uh, he, you know went out next day, he came back and he said, okay, you can go, I'll, I'll get you a scholarship. So that took me to um, University of Michigan uh, in 1981, 82, where I did my master in library and information science. So I went back after that uh, to the same university and uh, uh, worked on the automation project. So it was a, a good thing. Uh, we completed the automation uh, of the library. And even at that time, I uh, had interest and worked on an, an expert, trying to get an expert system to actually automate the card catalogs. And instead of manually typing them on a typewriter, um, I was uh, uh, started a small project to automate that process where you could uh, automatically generate the card cards for the card catalog. Um, it wasn't easy because those days we didn't have, you know, graphics terminals. Everything were what's called dummy terminals, ASCII text, all you can put on the, on the screen, so you could not do layouts and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, you could print it out, uh, insert commands and all that stuff and printed it out, uh, but it wasn't an, an easy project. So um, two years later, uh, working in the library, doing the automation, I got the chance to go to uh, Sheffield for a University of Sheffield for a conference uh, organized by the British Council. Okay. So I went there and I met uh, Peter Wallet, who was one of the uh, known people in information retrieval. So I dropped by his office and I asked to talk to him and I said, do you have any projects for a possible PhD uh, work? Mm. Uh, well, he handed to me something, the draft the proposal, and he said, take a look at this. And if you're interested, we can talk about it. So I took it back to the hotel. I read the proposal. It was information retrieval uh, uh, project, uh, the proposal is to create a full text database. Uh, hmm. And now this is back in 1986. And um, at that time, there there is no documents exist in uh, text forms uh, as a whole document. Um, everything is pretty much in defined as fields and database fields and limited size and all that stuff. Of course, we had back then the bibliographic services like Dialogues and others um, where you can do Boolean searches 
on uh, uh, databases and retrieve bibliographic information, but no such thing as full text database. So that was an interesting uh, project, but I thought I'll give it a try. You know, this is really intriguing. Right. So I, um, I went back and I told him, sure, I'll work on it. Uh, so now become the next step. If we can get funding, as things will go on. So uh, he said, I wrote to the British Council and see if they uh, if they will fund, you know, the project and yeah. we can go from there. So I went I went home and a few months later we got a uh, answer from British Council uh, where I was awarded two years from the Commonwealth scholarship from the Commonwealth to uh, to work on the project. So the following year, I went back to Sheffield and uh, worked on the project. At that time, there was a very interesting um, system that was developed in Sheffield. Um, it's called Instruct, which basically experimental information retrieval system that was developed in Pascal on a mainframe computer. And um, so I went back, I took a look at that and um, started to tweak it and work with the system to see if I can turn it into a full text system. So that become my uh, uh, doctoral uh, dissertation, which was um, uh, the, the, the title was Paragraph Based Information Retrieval. And the reason we term it as paragraph based because um, it is not possible to put a whole document on the computer back then, especially on mainframe right. computer. And the only way you can think about it is to divide the document into paragraphs yeah. and somehow create a structure to connect them together and then create a whole document. So yeah. that was the idea. Uh, behind the, the project. Uh, so I, I worked on the system. I did all the programming. Uh, and in fact, uh, I joined the program there in 87 and 88. I have the first publication at um, SIGIR in Grenoble. Um, and it was about uh, uh, using um, what is the sort of the best algorithms that, that you could implement for a full text database. Now that's also at that point, uh, free text where you could search on keywords is something in you. Um, that even um, the, the, the obstacle way there was always a storage because if you create an inverted list and index all the keywords in the text, which today we do it without thinking, at that time that was not possible because you don't have this enough storage. Right. Uh, you know, if you have a 40 megabyte hard disk on your computer, you're the lucky guy at that point. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's, everything is limited and we're using CD-ROMs and floppy disks and stuff like that. Um, but there was, uh, all this work was done on a mainframe computer. So when it comes to testing the software and testing the product and the algorithms, you need full text documents. Right. So then somebody told me, if you go to the uh, uh, computer department, some of the computer science students wrote their dissertation on the mainframe. Um, and uh, at that time, what we what is called uh, uh, line editor. Uh, basically, the whole document is written line after line right. and with um, commands inserted into the text. If you want to print bold and italic, you will have to put slash bold slash italic uh, mm. on the screen. And then when you send it to the printer, it comes out bold italic. Well, yeah. Uh, so that was the, you know, the time I was working and playing with with all that uh, that stuff. So I managed to get um, several documents uh, from the uh, computer science department 
which sort of uh, form the base for my testing. Um, so we developed at that time what we term it as the nearest neighbor search algorithm that works with full text documents. And that was my basically research project. Uh, from there, I uh, went to Singapore, as you know. So I, I applied uh, to, at that time, graduated from Sheffield in uh, 1990 and uh, started to look for a job. So I saw an ad in IEEE, Computer Journal, uh, for an Institute of uh, System Science in Singapore, which is part of National University of Singapore. And that was, that institute was set up as um, sort of parallel or, or similar to the MIT labs. Um, and the government invested a lot of money in turning Singapore into an IT hub and uh, invited a lot of researchers to come in. So I said, OK, drop them an email. So I dropped them an email. And uh, uh, next day, I got a response from uh, one of the people working there. And he said, well, I happen to be in London. And if you come down for an interview, we can talk. Mm -hmm. so, so the next day, I took the train and met him in London. And he offered me the job right away. He said, wow. OK, that's what we're looking for. And um, um, you know, so I, I said, well, great. So I went and, to Singapore. And which, and which year was this when you first went to Singapore? So that was 1990. 1990. So I, 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 graduated, I graduated late 89, early 90, and a few months later, okay. I was in Singapore um, uh, working in the Institute of System Science. And the first project I worked on it there was Picture Archival System. And that it was for the Singapore television, which is to automate the uh, images for the news, all the uh, images that the television used for the news, uh, how do you index them, how do you retrieve them, and that sort of thing. Right. So I went on to use the same algorithms, the same um, ideas uh, in implementing that software. And I remember we had an IEEE uh, conference in Singapore in 1991, uh, where I presented a paper on the project. And we had uh, Bruce Croft, who visited Singapore at that time. And he he's one of those big people in um, information retrieval. Okay. And he uh, looked at the project. We, we, we show him a demo of the project, which what was doing is using uh, uh, ranking uh, algorithms and relevance feedback. So we wanted some um, uh, sort of intelligent way of uh, taking the user feedback and then sorting out the images according to that. Now, this was purely based on text. So there was no image processing. Uh, later on, we tried to use image processing for trademark department right. uh, based on the idea. But uh, uh, he looked at the system and said, I never know that all the stuff we do actually works. Because uh, <laughs> <laughs> in the 80s, most of the work were done on text and right. using mathematical models and statistical analysis, all of that stuff without really knowing whether all this actually works in real, real life. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but that was a very good uh, demonstration of uh, how information retrieval algorithms actually do, do work. So in a sense, my project, you could say that that was the first serious work on creating a full text database back in yeah. the 90s. 90s yeah. um, which is sort of paved the way to, you know, internet searches and all that stuff. Um, basically, one of the things that I found out in the uh, the research we did, that actually the best performed weighting functions, uh, mathematical model, was the simplest one. 
which was the inverse document frequency model, uh, which is still until today is basically from the basis for most of information retrieval uh, algorithms. Mm -hmm. um, so that was the journey, uh, took me all the way to um, when, when you said we were in <laughs> Nanyang technology. Nanyang. I, I think you joined in 98, right? From your CV, that's, that's what you mentioned. Correct. So what happened is in 1990 and 91, um, in 92, I got uh, industrial project, which is with the NAC Singapore, a Japanese company uh, that uh, put a tender, a bid for the trademark project in the Ministry of Law in Singapore. And they got the, the project, but they didn't have a, a product. Right. So they came to us at the National at the uh, uh, Institute of uh, uh, Science, and they said, do you have a solution? So they heard about the television project, and uh, they expressed interest. So at that time, uh, I, uh, I was working at the Institute. Uh, but then they offered me to work as a consultant to them. So that's the time when I actually took the consulting job and I started working with the NEC Singapore, which is then led to forming a company uh, was called Information Technology Private Limited and uh, Consultant Private Limited. And um, then I got a few other projects with Petronas in Malaysia and um, other the uh, uh, Singapore port and other places uh, where we developed um, documents and uh, records and document management. Right. Uh, and then later on, we worked with the um, Kuala Lumpur International Airport, LIA, uh, where we also implemented the drawing management system for them for the new airport. So who all so, started started this company that you're talking about, the consulting company? In 92. So the 90, um, 92, late 92, uh, that's where I got the consulting project to work on the trademark system. So what happened is that the trademark system, they said, you're free to use the algorithms because that's yours. We're only mm -hmm. interested in the product. So, uh, but you're free to, uh, to, to market the engine. Right. Uh, so we went and used the, developed the engine into a document, uh, records and document management. And that's how it started. So the company, uh, I worked with another company in, in New Zealand called Contact Data System. Okay. And um, they had a branch in San Francisco. So we implemented several projects in New Zealand and um, the US as well uh, at that time. And the uh, in 1997, we had the Asian economic crisis. Oh, yes, yeah. I remember that. I, I remember that, yeah. And uh, that was difficult because, you know, economies collapsed. The, do the dot com bust. The dot com and the, yeah. uh, well, it was the Asian where it started in Thailand and then. Um, Korea and you know all these economies and we were heavily invested in Malaysia working with the government on a bigger project uh, to automate the schools actually to turn the records and document management system which was called DAX document uh, abstraction and control system we term it and we were planning to uh, turn it into a learning uh, system like Blackboard and Canvas, basically, and uh, automate the curriculum in the uh, schools in Malaysia. So it was a, a very ambitious, big project, but then the collapse of the economies in Asia, all these projects got canceled. Right. So overnight, you know, out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it become difficult to operate um, given the economic situation. And we were actually sort of trying to get investors 
um, in, to invest into the product and the software. But that didn't happen because the economic, you know, um, condition didn't allow that. And um, so I decided, okay, enough is enough. Um, I sold the, uh, the product to another company. Yeah. Uh, they were interested in the in the software, so they bought the the engine, and I went back to teaching. So that's and, where and, I joined. And do you want to mention how much did you sell it for, the, the engine? About three hundred thousand at that time. Wonderful. So okay. three hundred thousand uh, U.S. dollars. So it was in it was in a big money because the um, situation was really bad, and I thought that probably, um, I mean, cash flow become a serious problem uh, right. to sustain a business. That's what forced forced me to um, call it, you know, off and go back to uh, academia. So that's when I joined the um, NTU, where NTU used to have an incubation. Uh, oh, yes, Center, incubation center for new, new ideas. I remember that, yeah. And I and I used to part of that. So okay. actually, my company was was part of that incubation center. So, um, so they were they were, I, they were I, helping student ideas turn into possible companies, small companies, all that to take the ideas and incubate it there, provide some seed right. funding. Yeah. Yeah, and they invited more companies. That's where I joined them because that was the. It was an old building. They didn't know what to do with it. So they turned it into an incubation center. Right. And uh, it was at low rent and stuff like that. So it was very attractive. So that's where I, uh, and, it, and it has a, a good uh, support because you have student, access to students, you have access to faculty, uh, to work. And uh, so I used to hire students as well uh, right. from uh, NTU. So because of that, I, I knew people at NTU. So when the economic situation, because when it become tough, uh, some of them hinted to me, why don't you just come and, you know, and teach. join us? Yeah. And um, I, I used to work with them uh, sort of part time because I, I, I didn't want to totally cut myself from research and academia. So I continued actually to publish, even when I was running a company. Yeah. Uh, we, we, we actually, I, I think I, I published more when I was running the company than when I'm not. Right. Uh, okay. And I did consulting to a, a company in Bangalore for a while, where we also published papers. Uh, uh, they were developing a, uh, that's around, around 2000, uh, um, where they were developing a knowledge portal. So we're already into knowledge management uh, and, and trying to, to do things that today is like taking for granted, where you know we have every organization today has a knowledge portal, single um, login place, and you get all integrated uh, applications. And so that company was trying to do that back in, so just trying to create a knowledge <clears throat> a knowledge management system for that system at that back then yeah, you know we had, yeah. we had some uh, products like intranets and stuff like that so the ideas were sort of emerging and i was working with them um, so i used to go to bangalore every six months um, to work with them uh, on that project so they hired me as a consultant while i was working at uh, ntu and then in NTU, I started the knowledge management, the master in yeah, knowledge right. management uh, program at that time, um, which was an interesting venture because our understanding of knowledge management is that it has to be a combination of academic and um, practice so sort of so, industry so before we get there for the people who may not know do you want to briefly mention what knowledge management is all right so yeah um maybe i should i should discuss how how i sort of got into knowledge management right. so um 
Um, as I said, we are developing documents and records management and drawing management. So we're dealing with um, first coming from automation of libraries and then to um, document management in general. Uh, in the early 90s um, and around 95, when knowledge management become uh, sort of popular, um, most people perceive knowledge management as an IT issue. Right. Um, and, and most companies were interested in knowledge management as a document management. So, this, so most of people view knowledge management as an IT extension to IT, as, as what we today probably we look at um, data science and AI and all these right. things. Basically, we have a history of you know chasing those ideas from hyper media to hyper text to um, virtual reality to knowledge management. To, right. So so. Basically, IT and industry is always chasing new concepts to, right. to get yeah. people excited and get involved. So knowledge management is one of those that perceived as a technology and is largely document management. Uh, so since we have been there, it was, wasn't a, a new to us as a kind of natural transition to knowledge management. But then knowledge management is really came about in the late 80s and early 90s from the realization that actually IT, um, and, and, and I think that in the late 80s and early 90s, there was this uh, drive toward AI and the, the idea that AI will replace people, technology will replace people. So we have this idea, even librarian was scared to death that we no longer need librarians because we can automate the place and who needs librarians? So they were resisting to technology in general. Right. And at that time, there was this realization that no, um, knowledge IT cannot exist really without people and become a realization that people are still the center of whatever we do. And I think like today, I, when I follow the AI conversation, it reminds me with that time that we sometimes tend to lose focus of people right. and think that AI will take over and you know everybody will be uh, obsolete, but that's not it true but from historical perspective, uh, the more IT or an automation happen, the more jobs are created. Yes, some become obsolete, but more and more are created. And New jobs are created, for, yeah. Yeah, and the, the reason for all this creation is people, because if you replace people's job, they're going to do something else. They're not going to stop, so they're just going right. to continue doing something else. So the creation will be, you know, continuous. And that is where knowledge management as a concept become that knowledge management is not about technology. It's about people and it's mainly about the knowledge processes and practices. So my own definition to knowledge management is, you know, anything to do with knowledge processes and practices from knowledge creation, knowledge discovery, knowledge retention, knowledge organization, and practices in terms of communities of practice, apprenticeship, uh, lesson learned, all these ideas yeah. is what knowledge management is. So knowledge management is a, is a wider concept than just technology. And the book by Nonako in 1995 yeah. was, a, was a turning point for one reason, because these guys look at what, why Japanese companies are more creative and what was the reason for that. And then they came up with this concept of tacit knowledge, which basically something that cannot be codified. You cannot take it out of people 
and it can only transfer from one person to another the other. Yeah. through uh, socialization. Um, and that type of knowledge is very valuable for organizations to survive. Um, and most of the times organizations fail when they fail to recognize that part of the, the knowledge. And I think we are codifying some of your knowledge through this interview right now. Exactly. So <laughs> we're, <laughs> yeah. we're, we're hopefully doing some of yeah, that. Yeah. But, uh, but that's the idea. And, uh, and you know, if it, when, we, when we talk about, go back to talk about the, the uh, data information, uh, knowledge, wisdom pyramid, uh, which is sort of an sort of an easy way to represent the relationship between those those things. Um, you will find a lot of discussion, a lot of debate goes around those concepts because they're not really that straightforward uh, relationships. Right. Um, everything, in fact, we do, everything exists in books, databases. Um, out there is, is just data. Um, information is only happen when somebody, you know, when it when it actually moves. So it's 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 even from the term inform, if it you have to inform somebody, you have to tell me what you know so I can appreciate what you have. Right. And that time that what information happened. And knowledge is sort of the action that takes place based on information moving around. And wisdom is nothing more than skills and competences that we developed over time. And that's why they are insights, in a sense, because the more you do it, the better you get at it. All right. And if you're, you know, anything you do in life, the more you do it, the better you get at it naturally. And that's the tacit knowledge component of it. Right. So would you say that uh, any information that which is there in a book, which which let's say you've not read, it's, a, it's on a shelf in the library, uh, that is data? Just data. Just data. And unless someone takes the book and then starts reading it something. Exactly. And I always, I always use the, the uh, example of what do we mean by life system? Now we are in an interview. I see you, you see me. And we are on a live system, um, computer system, uh, hardware. Right. And the way we do that, we can say this is this is live, is because there is a continuous sending and receiving of information between the sender and the receiver. The minute that stop, information stop. Basically, <laughs> everything is stored at your end is data. Everything is stored at my end is data. data. If we don't communicate, so there's no there's no information going. Information is a story. If you tell it, it replicates itself and sometimes modifies and change all the time. Um, because if you tell the story to one person and you ask the tenth person, you will not get the same story. Oh, right. Because everybody will tweak it and change it. And that is the information. That's what we have on social media. That's what we have on wherever there is a social gathering, uh, whether it is uh, you know face to face or virtual. Um, information moves, and and people do take action. So when people act on the information, that's when knowledge actually happens. So it's it's a it's sort of you can think of. Static information, static is data. Anything is static is data. Anything moves is information. Right. Any action is knowledge. And any competency is wisdom. Because, because the more you, you know, the, the life experience is a wisdom because it's, you gain so much from being there and experience something. Um, if, as I said, if you if you are uh, you bake a cake, the more you bake the same cake, the better taste. The better you get. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Continuously, you get better at it. Right. Um, and sometimes you learn it from other others, but you can also learn it by yourself by trial. 
And if you do it multiple times, you can get maybe good at it. So uh, you don't need to be coached all the time, but coaching is faster. So, you know, instead of I have to do it 20 times to get it right, if somebody teach it to me in one it's minute, better. it's much yeah. easier. And yeah. that's where um, become the value of social socialization and the knowledge transfer. So well, that's why knowledge transfer and knowledge sharing is one of those information, knowledge management processes right. that with a lot of emphasis. So uh, I had one more question on this. Uh, I read a paper recently where somebody was questioning uh, the term knowledge management. It's, I think a lot of people have been questioning, saying that it's a wrong term and people don't understand knowledge management very well when you use the term knowledge management. So what do you have any thoughts on that as to should there be another term rather than knowledge management? It's, yeah, I, I guess if you want to sort of look at is it the right terminology or not, it is not because managing knowledge is sort of, if you think of knowledge as an action, what does managing actions mean Right. in a sense? But then for the, uh, you know, the, the fact that it is hard to come up with a very good term for it. You just have to go along with it. And, but then we, we, we the, sort of we have to teach people what it really means. Right. Um, I mean, I, I think it's philosophy is another, another term that is one of those meta, you know, disciplines yeah. that is so important to everything you do in life but is philosophy is the right term? The minute right. you hear philosophy, you might say, well, this is just, <laughs> you know. So maybe philosophy is not the right term too. Right, yeah. Um, and knowledge management is probably similar in that in that sense. Uh, but I look at look, look at knowledge management as a sort of an umbrella term rather right. than um very, you know, specific, exact. Yeah, exact term. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, so you were talking about starting the master's in knowledge management at NTU. So what uh, prompted you to start that at that point? So what happened is uh, at that time, there was an interest by the government of Singapore in knowledge management. But at that time, we, want, we um, uh, realized that if uh, knowledge management is also grounded or, or there's a lot of interest in the industry with knowledge management. So we came up with this idea to uh, uh, team up with the industry where we have half of the students sent by the industry and half of the students from the government. And we were successful in getting that going. So we had half of the students funded by the government and half right. funded uh, by the industry. So we had uh, funding um, total funding for students, uh, where we started with 20 students, 10 from the industry and 10 from the uh, uh, government. And it worked very well. A lot of the students who graduated from there had, you know, the, the experience of, of, of what it means to here and what it means to there. And, and given the fact that Singapore runs as a as a company singapore government as a whole runs as a company yeah www.sg right that's, <laughs> that's, yeah. that's right so uh that gives the students the ability to uh adjust and you know um they didn't really see much different and uh however um a lot of the public sector practices which is sort of, you know, looking at knowledge management as um, sort of money, but also service, look at it as both, is a combination of, of money and service to the company is, is means, um, you know, wealth generation, means uh, 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 money making. But where, what does it mean for the public sector? And that was to look at it as, um, more, more of how do you serve the public? Sort of what best practices 
what is the uh, the the what are the type of knowledge management processes and practices that can enhance the 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 service government service and i think it came at the time where also there was a lot of interest in e government um, so that was also a driving factor in uh, getting the government to uh, get excited. Oh, I remember it, e every, everyone talked on e-government and doing projects on e-government at that point, yeah. Yeah, at that yeah. point was, yeah, was yeah. very important. And um, I e remember... E-commerce e and e-government e both, I think. That's correct. And yeah. I remember I gave a, a talk at uh, uh, in Tunisia in 2005 uh, for the, com the United Nations Conference on Information society and uh, my talk was about e knowledge management and e-government using singapore as an example because singapore was one of the pioneering uh, countries in implementing it and implementing e-government um, uh, so that that presentation was very relevant at that time uh, looking at mostly most countries around the world were at that conference, very interested in, you know, how to how do you um, use technology in governments? Because yeah. uh, it was largely a lot of um, government people attending the conference, and um, and I did a I did a talk, invited by the Tunisian government to give a talk, largely because of my writings at that time on the Information Society. Uh, I published a book in, uh, uh, at that time, uh, uh, published by Magro Hill about Information and Knowledge Society, which right. sort of discuss also um, uh, about all the issues that related to uh, the use of technology, uh, because there were also concerns about the use of technology and even concerns about the use of internet at that time right. um, in terms of privacy, in terms of security, in terms of... Now, those issues, they didn't go away. We still have... Yeah, it's still and actually more important now than than ever. Uh, but but in the early stages, when you talk about, you know, going from nothing to uh, suddenly uh, getting people to sign up and uh, automate processes, uh, it's a big test. And everybody was interested. I remember talking to a lot of people from different countries at the conference, and they were all very interested in how do you deal with getting more people to participate, except, of course, for a lot of countries, like, you know, developing countries, they don't even have electricity. How are you going to talk about e-government? Uh, right to those issues. So um, then mobile technology came along. Uh, at that time, we didn't have that idea where could people could have mobile uh, technology and even use, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, sort of um, alternative technology to, to electricity where you yeah. could generate you know electricity and, and that sort of thing uh, which is today is pretty common in a lot of countries where they are connected by cellular but might might be the connection is slow uh, yeah. but they still connected um, they can access the Inter internet. internet yeah so interesting because in I was in Jordan um, last year and I use I I had to go and uh, do some services with the uh, uh, sort of government there and then I found out that they actually mandated that all um, services has to be electronic but yeah. then not everybody have access to internet and that uh. sort of thing so as a result you have now specialized entities that do it for you. So you go and pay to them and then they connect and pay on your behalf. Uh, okay. So you don't have any access, they'll do it on your behalf. 
because the government mandated that everything has to be electronic, like paying electricity bills, the water bills, doing, you know, any service you have to do with the government, you have to log in and do it online. They don't want people to handle cash to, uh, or checks and stuff like that. So it not is, everybody connected, so then you have now people who do it on your behalf. So, so it is digital divide and then some entrepreneurial solutions to bridge the digital divide. Exactly. Right. So the interesting thing, you could have a, a van and somebody sitting in the van somewhere there on the side of the road and right. have a sign there and you can walk to them and then they you, you pay them and then they'll log in from their yeah. phone <laughs> and yeah. do it for you. <laughs> um, so that, that's the kind of uh, uh, interesting things that are happening right now. And and also uh, earlier you mentioned uh, in, that uh, you you had the hard drive that you had was like 40 megabytes, I think one of the earlier systems uh, that you used, right? And I remember when I was in NTU, uh, most of my seniors had like eight, I think 840 megabytes hard drives. And I bought my first computer that time in 1995 with 1. 1.6 gigabyte. And people thought like, what are you going to do with so much space? And now we have like terabytes and all that and it's still here. Well, interesting because I worked with a company in New Zealand called Contact Data System. And they were actually a spin-off of IBM. Two guys who worked for IBM, then they spin off and started their own company. And the first time I visited them in Christchurch in New Zealand, I walked into their office and then I saw a, a small device on display in the lobby. And it's like a small refrigerator basically, but uh, on the front of it is engraved four megabyte of storage, uh, revolutionary in storage, four megabyte. Wow. Uh, like, <laughs> so, <laughs> so you know how things evolved over time. Yeah. Uh, but I did work with forty megabyte hard disk for the trademark project in in Singapore, where we actually uh, they started the implementation on a LAN local area network, not an IBM framework. Uh, 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 but rather on on uh, PCs. Right. Those PCs were delivered and they were 386 with 40 megabyte hard disk. Yeah. And at that time, they were revolutionary too, that you have 40 megabyte the hard disk yeah. and you can store a lot of information on it. And now you're connecting them together with a server configuration. And, three, um, and 386 processes. Yeah. That's right. And then and then we took a project with Petronas, the oil company in Malaysia, and uh, they wanted to automate the uh, safety and engineering manuals, the manuals that they normally print and right. ship to different, you know, places. Um, now they want to convert them into text and put them on a CD-ROM and send them out as a CD-ROM rather than um, uh, printed manuals. And we did that for them. So we automated those, those uh, manual, converted them uh, 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 using OCR, optical character recognition, and converted them to text and printed them on a CD. It took us a week to cut yeah. the CD. Wow. Because with that time, we had a Philips, um, CD writer that kept heating and breaking down. So it writes like halfway and break down uh, because it overheat. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Can you imagine that CD writer was that big yeah. with an engine that heats up? Um, uh, but but when we had when we successfully cut the first CD it was a party. It was like wow, <laughs> <laughs> we did it. <laughs> Two. To so, a... Yeah, so so how did you get from Singapore to the US? So what happened, I was working at UNT and uh, I got a I got a somebody contacted me from University of Oklahoma. So I, I I wrote my first book 
and uh, information and knowledge society, uh, which was also uh, that book adopted as a textbook uh, by the businesses, by one of the lecturers uh, in the uh, Harvard Business School. So he was, he was using it as a textbook for a couple of years. Yeah. And uh, um, so we wrote, I wrote that book with Tom Hart, who was a professor at uh, Florida State University. He was visiting Singapore, so we collaborated and we wrote the book together. And he had a friend in University of Oklahoma, and they were looking for somebody to start their knowledge management program right. in Tulsa, Oklahoma. So they contacted me and said, will you be interested to come over and help us to set up the uh, knowledge management program. Right. And um, at that time, I said, sure, why not? And uh, so that's how I, I made the journey from there to, uh, to the US. To the US. So taking you back a little bit to your childhood, right? Uh, so what were your childhood years like? Uh, like who, who all were there at home? What did you like doing as a child? Pretty much uh, reading and <laughs> writing. I was uh, always uh, interested in, uh, um, I mean, I, 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 I used to read a lot of books uh, okay. when, I was, when I was young. And uh, that sort of things that uh, the reason was I sort of become interested in libraries and um, you know, library automation and knowledge management and sort of, those things sort of happen as nothing you planned. It's just like, you know, you go from one thing to another. It just happened to, to be the, you know, the right time, the right place, and you do those, yeah. those types of things. So basically, um, I, I, my, I, I had at some point interest in painting. <laughs> oh, you had an interest uh, in painting? In painting, so I did a couple of oil paintings uh, uh, at some point. Uh, I still have interest in that. It would, you know, if I have the time. I, now I don't have the time. Uh, maybe when I retire, I go back and. Oh, that uh, uh, that is amazing. Oh. That so we both shared that. Like I had done these two paintings that you see. You yeah. did that one. Wow. I, I did both these. Yeah, these two oils, oil paintings. That, that's amazing. That's good. Thank you. No, I didn't. I didn't know you paint. So, so that's interesting. So, that was that was uh, when you were a child. You, you used to paint since then, or was it in college? It was a was it was early. Um, you know, I probably in the high school, and then in the at the university. So, high school wasn't was in West Bank that time. Yeah, I mean, it was like a spare time when you have, when you have time to. Uh, to kill, <laughs> right, right. You'll, you'll do, but uh, you know, I did physics, and physics is not easy. So uh, between physics and you know other things, you can find some time to to be in. Uh, but it is one way to be less um, less serious. To be less serious. Way. Because right. it's, uh, you know, when you're doing physics, you're uh, sort of logical in everything you do. You're, you're, um, so painting could be the, the kind of way to uh, not to be serious and, and, and look at the creativity from different angles. Um, right. That's how I would look at it. No, I, I think that that's that's really interesting. And did somebody teach you, or did what did you, were you self taught? I I had uh, um, sort of followed the um, <clears throat> the art, what, what what sort of like um, you know famous artists and uh, famous paintings, and always I admire those. I suppose like to go to the museum, like to go to. Uh, galleries and look at different and also also sort of perceived um, art as a one way to express yourself, express your right. feelings 
Um, and I always, when I sort of look at any painting out there, first things comes to mind is what the artist tried to tell me in, in that. So if I look at your painting out there, I would say, you know, I try to read your mind. I say what you actually were thinking when right. you actually did that. Uh, there must be some uh, thoughts went into oh, yeah. you know, all this. And, and sometimes it could be thoughts and feeling, combination of both, not yeah. just not just thoughts. So I uh, I sort of that that the sort of thing that you can represent or pre sort of express yourself in a way that you don't have to think much about it. Right. Uh, while while your painting is is because maybe people can read it, you know, without you telling them what you're trying to do. Yeah. And so I started when I was young and, and sort of I even had interest in language as well, you know, to, to, to sort of write poetry, write um, plays and stuff like that, uh, literature and so on. But I thought painting is more relaxing, <laughs> right. to be honest. That, so which, that, which languages did you write? In, you wrote in English, the plays and poetry? I wrote in English and Arabic. So my English and Arabic. tongue is Arabic. Arabic, yeah. And Arabic language is sort of one of those um, uh, artistic language that you yes. could sort of say something in 10 different ways. Uh, it has a more flexibility in, 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 in how you express yourself or how you describe something and, you know, that, that sort of things. Um, so um, yeah, mm -hmm. but I think I think painting is um, a sort of uh, I guess on the on the fun part, right? Um, it's gonna take you to different dimension. <laughs> yeah. So the Arabic language lends itself to poetry more because of the way the language. More, yes. It's kind of the language of love and poetry and literature okay. and that sort of things. Yeah. So, uh, what ha what has been the role of uh, serendipity and chance uh, in the turning points in your professional journey? Like, what are the... I think all of it. Uh, probably everything I did was in to plan. Um, I don't think I planned to do anything. Even coming to UNT uh, uh, for my last job wasn't even planned. It's like um, I always happy where I am, right? Uh, working sort of. But then something comes up and, you know, it either happened naturally uh, or something, it trigger it and it happens. Like, as I said, when I went to uh, yeah. study for library science, never thought of going from physics to library science. Uh, it's like unthinkable. Um, in fact, one interesting thing, when I arrived at the University of Michigan, I started the program and the first course I took was reference. Oh. And the first class was okay. The second class, I started questioning myself, what am I doing here? Because in the reference, the teacher was telling us this is encyclopedias, these are dictionaries. This is like, really? I mean, I, do I need to spend <laughs> time <laughs> <laughs> to do this, you know, you come from physics where numbers and math and, you know, science and logic and all of that. And now you're in different field where, you know, uh, been introduced to um, uh, different types of books as like, okay. Um, so I, that kind of a trigger, the question of, Okay, what can I do besides this? <laughs> you know, right. Besides learning those is is good. I I'm okay, uh, but what can I do else? So I started taking some computer classes to supplement what I'm what I'm doing, um, because then it become you know um, for me more interesting. I'm kind of bridge between 
science and social science and find a way in the middle. That right. is to use your brain, the left and the right side of your brain, not just one of them. So that's a, and, and that's I think that's an interesting because I think you cannot be one-sided. You will have, and that's where I think creativity comes in, as where you appreciate arts and you know painting and that sort of things. Um, if you uh, so so I, I I was able to find something in the middle, <laughs> like, right. you know, combine these two, which has been. I think it has been rewarding because I think our field, the information field, is is a hybrid of both. It's a, it's a it's sort of a, a, a the, the evolution of it over time combined people from different fields that found common thing to work on. So I remember when we're doing information retrieval, we had people from biology, chemistry. Right. Um, you know, computer science, uh, um, and I think information retrieval was very interesting field for me. I'm coming from physics, but then we are working with you know, car cataloging and classification, and um, you know all all this stuff. So abstraction, and so it's it is a it is you have to kind of be open to both things where yeah. some people might say, oh, no, this is not for me. You know, if you have a hardcore computer scientist, which I experienced when I was in Singapore, that we were located, the information studies department were located in the engineering, College of Engineering. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you remember? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and some of the colleagues there they will turn around and say, this is library stuff, not real engineering. Yeah, we are not engineers. <laughs> right. We're located in engineering, but to them, this is like library. This is not a real science, yeah. um, you know? So it's very few who can appreciate that, well, these people might bring something different. And then we, after that, we moved to uh, College of Communication and Journalism, um, which also um, continue to feel a little bit strange from journalism point of view. It's like a lot of journalists thought were not relevant. But over time, you know, those things become uh, merging. And I, even I, here at UNT, we have a PhD in information science. Uh, I started those in, 19, in 2013, where we added concentration into the PhD program in uh, cybersecurity, uh, journalism, linguistics, health informatics. We're just combining a lot of things. And data science. So students can still do information science with a concentration in those areas. Yes, yeah. And we have more people in these departments who didn't have uh, a PhD. They, they subscribed and, and work. And we still have you know, those concentration and those students specializing, coming from these disciplines, doing information science with concentration and a specialization in, in, in these areas. So now we can see more commonality, more uh, relevance uh, than what we had before. Uh, right. So yeah, it's, it's, it is an interesting field that, you know, as an interdisciplinary field, become more and more interesting. Yeah. So who, who are uh, some of the people who have influenced uh, your work? Oh, uh, I think the early people were information retrieval people. Um, uh, mainly Salton uh, back then. I remember the first paper I presented was in Grenoble in uh, France, in SIG IR, and uh, I had tough question from Salton back then. Uh, 
Gerald yeah. Salton. So <laughs> he, yeah. he was a top person. Uh, but that make me appreciate, you know, the uh, that if you want to be in this area, you have to, you know, be up to the task. And yeah. uh, uh, so people like uh, Bruce Croft, uh, um, uh, Robinson, um, who else? Spark Jones, uh, all these people that I went, Tom Wilson, uh, you interviewed yes. Tom. He, when I went to uh, Sheffield, he was the department chair. Okay. And um, then I worked with him later on. Uh, we, uh, I, um, we edited a special issue on knowledge management and to try to remember the year uh, in the information research journal. And the title of the special issue is the uh, 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 Emperor, uh, what was it, the uh, uh, Emperor with no clothes or? Okay. You know, yeah. try to remember what the exact title is. But it, and, uh, Tom wrote an article there, he, he titled it The Nonsense of Knowledge Management. The nonsense about knowledge management. <laughs> Probably you come across that article. Yeah. But uh, uh, but to him was knowledge management is nothing but um, information management. Right. And uh, it's just a fad. And uh, he wrote that article. Uh, uh, but I thought that uh, editing that special issue was good because we sort of debate the issue and put it up, up there. Um, of course, Peter Wallet I, was my um, PhD supervisor. Uh, he is an amazing person. He, he has more than 600 publications. Um, I am one of those people who um, produced a lot of publications over, over time. He had a lot of uh, PhDs. He's a chemist. He, uh, uh, came from uh, chemistry. Um, who else? Um, yeah, we could continue to uh, sort of evolve over time. Uh, you know, um, yeah, so these are the early people who sort of are influenced so, with uh, our mostly the information retrieval. And uh, any, any books that, that have been a significant influence on you? Any particular books? There's a lot of books. Uh, I think uh, uh, in, in in information retrieval area, um, there are several ones. In uh, um, there's an introduction to information retrieval book that was written that uh, sort of was a good reference uh, book. Nanaka. Nanaka and Takeuchi. Takeuchi was was a good. Yeah. Uh, book for the reason that they were the first time to highlight the importance of tacit knowledge and explicit knowledge and the you know interaction between both, even though my people disagree with the spiral knowledge spiral model and how you know things transform, but still the fact that they they highlighted the issues. Uh, that was a very important book. There's another book uh, by Singhi, which is Learning Organization. A uh, very interesting book because that book touched on a number of things that are important from system point of view. Um, right. And uh, the, 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 the one of them is the personal mastery, which is one of those five different areas that he highlighted as an important for uh, learning organization. But personal mastery is sort of the idea that whether you are born as a leader or not, you know, whether you can be taught to be a leader or not, that's a, that's a question mark right. that is still there because people tend to be, you know, born with certain treats um that i i can see that because there's people who quiet uh but people are you know more spoken 
So right. uh, uh, tend to be. So those are sort of the treats that sometimes uh, can be taught, sometimes not. Um, and what is the difference between a manager and a leader? Uh, can you teach someone to be a leader? Can you teach someone to be a manager? So all these right. sort of discussed issues. Uh, and then the learning, double loop, single loop learning, and all of that. But one, one of the things that actually uh, always interests me is the idea of uh, that the more you push, the more the system push back which is the cultural issues, the, the issues related to culture, uh, especially organization culture. So, so what makes you successful as a person sometimes is not symbol whether you are good or bad, it's the environment and the organization culture that you, or the organization you work for. Right. So uh, you can take a very successful person who is doing very well in this organization and move him to the other organization and suddenly he's not effective, not good anymore. Yeah. And that was largely because of how the culture, the system, the processes, the practices of that organization has a big effect on the, the I think the environment and whether you are you're appreciated, praised or not, or whether you are people are trying this supportive, you see supportive people around. I think all those factors also probably pick a play a role. Also, also take into effect. So I think that book was an interesting, uh, it's a good, it's a good read. Um, and I think that's, that's important. Then, then there was a small book that was written around the same idea by two consultants who wrote a book, 10 Steps, to learning organization. And some of those steps were really useful. One of them is how to make people resource to each other. And how, to, how to make people? Resource to yeah. each other. Oh, okay. How, how, to, how to make people not reinvent the wheel and just right. ask each yeah. other. So you can just go and say, how can I do this? Rather than you try to figure it out yourself. Again yourself, yeah. And, and that's very important in, 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 uh, in making people successful, which goes back to mentoring, you know, uh, and, and so on. So, yeah. So any particular incident uh, or incidents which really influenced you? A lot of those incidents. <laughs> <laughs> Probably a lot of the things that I talked about were incidents that did influence me yeah. in a big ways uh, right. uh, professionally. I think it's uh, it's a lot of the things that I did. Yeah. Um, whether research or teaching or uh, sort of you know happened for for a reason, and that reason, as I said, is not bland. Yeah. It's just going sometimes with it and. Uh, uh, but I, I, I believe the, the big thing that sort of shaped my career along, along the way is, is the supportive environment, which sort of uh, the people who I work with, the people who um, uh, in the field in general, that, uh, uh, you know, wherever I went, I always have supportive colleagues, people right. who give a good advice and uh, um, build good relationships. And I think that's that's very important. No, I th and I think uh, it probably was to do with your own nature as well, because uh, you see, you find around what you give, right? Because it, yeah. you, you go and you support people, you, so you find supportive people around. It's a mutual. It's, it's, a, it's a mutual thing. Yeah, it's a mutual relationship. So you have to give to 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 expect to be able to get. Yeah, to be able to get. You, you yeah. should not expect anything if you yourself is not. Oh, not to giving it. it so. Yeah. And so, what are the some of the key skills uh, you have developed that have helped you over the years? Um, I think the 
there is really no one skill that you can say this is the, the thing that you have to learn. I think if being flexible uh, and being able to go along to also listen to other people in the sense that um, I, you all, I don't try to push my ideas hard in a sense. I can, I can suggest to somebody, uh, maybe we should do this, but if they think that there is a better way to do it, I'm open and I'm willing to go along with it. So that's, that's I think, one of the key things that to being successful is that you throw the idea out there, sort of like seed it and and let it grow. Um, don't try to force it right. to grow in one way or the other, but you know, trust that something will come up. So my philosophy, even for my PhD students and students in general, is that you don't have to figure out the solution today. Right. You just go home, sleep, you know, <laughs> uh, relax. And maybe in the morning you have a different idea and and yeah. you figure it out. So I think that's that's the to me, that's the kind of key element that I don't have to have all the answers for everything. Yeah. Um you can always uh uh Think about it, and uh, I, I would always say, use the term, the sky is not falling, you know, okay. just take it easy and, and it will be okay. So basically not being too attached to your own ideas. Correct. Right, yeah. And not force it, yeah. And not forcing it. So uh, which phases of your life uh, have made you resilient? Like what were the hardest and challenging times uh, that required you to be strongest and uh, not break down under pressure? Maybe one from your childhood days and maybe then later on. Actually, that's, a, that's an interesting question and, and it is a, a good one, especially when you're in a managerial position, leadership position, and when you encounter a lot of problems, you might encounter somebody walk into your office and scream at you. Um, you know, unexpectedly or something like that. The the key to me is that always is um, to to be re resilient. Is that as I said, is things that it's not the end of the world. Um, the attitude, developing a good attitude toward things, toward people, and. Um, not, I always sort of look at people as you're like looking at your fingers. If they were the same length, you cannot catch any. All so right. the fact they are of different length is big for a reason because they give you strength. And if I'm working with other people, looking at other people who are different, I look at it as a strength. I don't expect everybody to do the same thing. And that sort of give me different perspective of things to say that, um, um, you know, that's okay, you know, uh, to, to expect from people different th things. And um, it's the collective of all these, that's what makes the difference. Right. Because if every one of us do the same thing, then there is really no um, differentiation. And we might not be able to achieve anything if we all, you know, superstars. Then if we're all leaders, then there is no, um, <laughs> you know, people to lead. So you have to have, you know, all kinds of people, basically. All types of people out there. And uh, and that's what gives you the strength. So, you know, if I look at that from management point of view, is that if you want to be successful as a successful manager, you have to recognize 
that people have different skills, have different abilities, and have different traits. And that's how sort of give me a better way of looking at things and be more successful. Sort of, if you look at it, it's kind of resilience, but it is also a look at it as an attitude. Right. Um, you know, because if you have the right attitude and you um, approach it in the right way, that saves you the, the, the issues, the sort of help you. Yeah. Anyway. So and any particular incidents or, or phases like where you developed that resilience or where you where you were required to be resilient? That the, can you think of or describe any hard or challenging times in your life? I guess the hardest part of your life is whenever you are going from one environment to another and you don't know what to expect. Um, in in your a new venture, yeah. uh, it's like you know me going to England to Singapore or coming back to the U.S. So, um, and you don't sort of anticipate what you don't know what to anticipate out there and what sort of expectations from you. Um, so those are those are kind of areas where you have to be confident of yourself. It's basically believe in yourself right. that I can do it. I can be up to the challenge. And other than that, I think once you you know adjust, can figure out you know, your space and you're comfortable with your space, you're okay. But I think in between is the difficulties. Yeah. So one more thing you mentioned was that resilience is like an attitude of seeing things positively and seeing people as different but important. Uh, how did you develop that attitude? Do you have any recollection? Like, how did you get that positive attitude? Um, I don't know. <laughs> Thank you. I don't I don't know how I arrived to that because some people always tell me you don't get angry. <laughs> it's like right. I've never seen you angry. I mean, a lot of people, you know, even when I was uh, department chair and program directors, people would always mention how come you keep your cool and not get angry. Um, and I I tell them I don't know. It's just I. I think it's sometimes it's not worth to be angry. Life is right. short. <laughs> right, right, yeah. You know, that's how I look at it. It's like, it, as I said, you know, I look at things like the sky is now falling. <laughs> yeah. There'll be there'll be another day, you know. Um, yeah. I, I, I think you cannot also take it too personal. If you take anything too personal, you get into trouble. Then you're in trouble, yeah. Because most people get into trouble when they become so attached to their ideas or feel they are, you know, being, they cannot take the criticism, for example. Yeah. And then that's a problem. I mean, you have to be open for criticism. Um, and you can turn it around and make people realize they were wrong if you don't react to it strongly, if you don't, you know, take it personal and and do the right thing. Uh, I think people turn around and say, I was wrong. Right. Uh, yeah. And uh, and that's the that's I think my perspective on 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 life is come from the idea that you know there will be another day to live and life is short right and, and the way i like to look at it is uh, i think in terms of uh, giving versus getting and a lot of times if we think of a life as giving right or doing or contributing then we are fine all the time because our job is to contribute 
But if we think of a life as getting that pe people should be doing for me, or I should be getting this position or this promotion or this whatever, this article published or whatever, anything that you're thinking of getting, right? That's when you get angry and disturbed and all that because you are badly trying to get and you're not getting it. But right. if, you, if your job is to just work and to keep doing your work, then there is nothing much to be disturbed. That's, that's, that's true. And sometimes viewing things that as an entitlement is a problem. Yeah. You know, because you... I'm not entitled to anything. Why should I be entitled to anything? Right. Uh, so sometimes feeling that sense of entitlement and people owe you, you know, owe you something, right? For one reason or the other, I think it's a problem. You know, even working with the students, if you expect your student to do something and they fail to do it, you cannot be just sitting there scolding them without understanding why they failed to deliver. Right, yeah. You know, the, the sense of entitlement, because I am your professor, you have to do something, that's not correct. And I think that the same for any other things in life. No. You know, your employee, your, uh, your staff, your faculty, um, you know, even work as a, manager in a company the same thing is if you if you willing to listen and give and take i think that normally is a i'm not saying that works all the time because in some cases obviously it doesn't work but that doesn't mean if it doesn't work once it's not gonna work all the time right so you cannot generalize generalization is also you know, problem. Uh, one of one of the things I think uh, also the um, problematic is that you know when when you are actually sort of make a generalization and one incident sort of make you think that all people are the same or yeah. you know every everything's well, that, that's a, problematic um you know doing away with certain mental models is also very very important because we as a human seems to very easily develop certain mental models and uh, not get away from them and we try to force fit that mental model into new circumstances where they may not apply it it doesn't work right yeah rather than being and some of those mental models can be negative you might inherit some of those from other people. It's not even yours. Right. It was communicated to you and you never question. And that actually can be problematic as well. And, and, and I think some of this uh, stereotyping and what people disliking other communities or groups of people and all that comes from some of the stories we might have heard growing up. And then you use those stories as, as a models to judge people a lot of the times. And uh, and I find uh, a lot of the times when we disinformation spreads, right? Because the confirmation bias that you have as a result of those growing up things and those mental models fits with whatever is happening. So you don't try to see all perspectives and you just try to look at one thing and then reach a conclusion. That's, that's true. Right? That's true. And uh, I think Singhi talks about some of those in his book about mental models and... Uh, you know, stereotyping as well, um, because those are uh, can be inherited and and become sort of problematic over time. Right. And you be able, you should be able to question those things. And as I said, you know, generalization is gen normally is a problem um, because of one incident. You cannot assume that is going to be always the case. Uh, yes, yeah. So what is something you wish you knew earlier in life? A lot of things. <laughs> 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 uh, with, I would probably, yeah, I would have probably uh, done more uh, in certain areas. Um, you know, if I, if I would know, largely, uh, I would say not much on 
professional in terms of, you know, where the profession is or where we're going with that. But a lot of it on relationships with others, because I think if, if you would know, you would approach things differently that maybe um, make a big difference in, in, in the way you uh, talk, uh, uh, dealt with people over time. And I think that's always the human aspects of it that I believe is the most important one. Because sometimes we, we, we make assumptions, right? So we can, I mean, in absence of information, which is sort of a sense-making model right. <laughs> problem in information retrieval. And I saw your um, uh, interview with Darwin. Right. It's very, very interesting. Um, you know, if you have an information gap or a knowledge gap, you have to make assumptions that, uh, you know, uh, and of course, I always say if I, um, in knowledge management, you know, like when uh, HP uh, CEO said, if HP knows what HP knew, now we will be much better company. Uh, the same if I knew, you know, a lot of things that probably I knew, but I didn't know I know it at that time. Uh, I would have done much better things in, in, in life. And uh, and that's where you 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 made assumptions, and those assumptions might be judged things wrongly. Right. And if I would have known, I would have done it differently. You want to give any specific example, like what kind of assumption uh, we we may we make and which could be avoided, like in terms of when you say don't make assumptions. Well, I think it's, it's in terms of like precise examples and number of kind of maybe from management point of view where you sort of um, uh, make a decision and say program development or uh, creating um, a curriculum or, you know, that sort of things. And if I would have knew more about that, I would probably done it better. Okay. Uh, you know, uh, that sort that sort of things. But uh, it's also it's also if you would you know have um, ask somebody to to do a task, and um, it did not turn out the way you expected it. Um, maybe you did not recognize certain things that at that time you didn't really know very well what those things are. And if you would have known, then you would have done it differently. All right. So we, you talked about some of your values. So you want to talk about any specific uh, life principles or values that you follow or what are your life lessons? Uh, fairness. I think that's a, the thing that I always believe in, that you have, you do the things that right and leave the time to judge. Um, that, that's my sort of principle in life, is that uh, um, <clears throat> fairness is, and justice is such an important elements in life. And what you try always you try to be, you try to be fair, you know, and provide equal treatment to everybody and um, be fair in general to anything you do. Um, and the way to do that, of course, it's difficult to judge you know, whether you're actually being fair or not fair. But there is one thing that you know is whether you're doing the right thing or not. Right. Basically following the rules, for example. If, you, if, you're, uh, if you're a manager or a program director or a, uh, a dean or something, uh, you just follow the rules. And uh, 
the rule is the rule. You know, you can, it might be a fair rule or not fair rule, but that's not your to judge because it is uh, um, the safest way to to go about. Uh, you know, uh, ethics is very important in life, and ethics is very hard something hard to define. Uh, right. And we all, you know, strive to be, to do a good job and uh, uh, uphold ethical values. Uh, but then how do you define ethical values? Uh, you know, who, who set the definition, right. yeah. whether this is ethical or not ethical? Um, that is difficult, but there is a way to go about it. Is to follow the rules. Um, so so if, you, I think, if you're following a rule and you know that the rule is wrong, then what do you do? If you know the rule is, is wrong, but can you change the rule? Yeah, if you, yeah, maybe you can go about the process of changing or questioning. or Yeah, that's a different thing. I mean, if you know the rule is wrong, then you should work on trying to change the rule. Change the rule, yeah. Uh, but if you violate the rule, you create another set of problems. Right. Right. So if you're given a, a difficult task to say, yes, I know that this rule is not fair and it's not right. But if I violated it, it's going to create more complicated problem right. rather than, you know, solve it. So you so then you have an ethical dilemma. Because yeah. do you do you do it or not do it? And what are the consequences of doing it and not either doing one? It? Yeah. So you can speak against the rule, but you still might have to enforce the rule because that's the only thing that you can do. Right. Because if you don't do it, you're in trouble. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, so it it, it you, you this is interesting because in life you do face challenges and you do, you do come across gray areas that, you know, you, is there is a way to enforce the rule but compensate for it? That's something you can look into. Right. So if the rule is unfair or unjust and you are forced to follow the rule and you know is there another way to compensate for it, short of able to change the rule? Yeah. If you are able to change the rule, it's good, you know, that's great. But short of not able to change the rule and you're implementing it, is there other ways to compensate for that? Yeah. And a lot of times there is, which that's where you bring, <clears throat> you know, the values in, in people. That they can go above what it takes and do some more to help others. So mm -hmm. if you feel that the rule is not just or fair and you have to apply it, but then you can go above it to compensate for it, I think that's that's a, an important value. Yeah. So what does uh, happiness mean to you? Sorry? What does happiness mean to you? Happiness, so... <laughs> <laughs> What happened? Happiness. Uh, happiness is to see other people happy. I derive happiness from other people happy. If the people around me are happy, I am happy. Uh, if they're not happy, definitely I'm not a happy guy. Well, that's lovely. And uh, and what are your goals now? Um, I I I to do as much as I can while I can. Uh, you know, because I think we are getting older and at one point where you just have, cannot go any farther. And so I think is my goal is to contribute um, to people's happiness <laughs> because that makes me happy if I have mm -hmm. more people happy and to do as much as I can, you know, while, they, while I'm strong. Right. So I think once you're not able to do, that's the end of the, the journey. But, but as long as you can go, you know, you should keep going. Keep going, right. 
And uh, what mentoring advice would you have for people uh, who might follow in your footsteps? I would say that, you know, exactly what I just said is that the sky is not falling and don't take it too personal. Um, always remember your fingers are not the same link because that's what gives you the strength to catch things. Uh, right. The fact that they are different, you know, size. So um, that's that's basically the, the, the key. Right. And uh, is there anything uh, that you still wanted to talk about which we didn't uh, touch upon? No, I think we're over time. Uh, no, 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 we are fine. <laughs> <laughs> no, we are fine. Okay. <laughs> No, this was no. We are still within the time that I said. Uh, oh, is yeah. it? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, no, thank you, Professor Hawande. I think this was uh, lovely, and uh, it, it. I have known you on and off over the years uh, as a student, and then ICKM and at ASIST, and uh, it's really wonderful to uh, get to know some other aspects of your lives, uh, which I hadn't known about uh, before talking to you. Well, thank you very much. Yes. But uh, I've always admired the efficiency you bring in and uh, what some of what you mentioned is that you're always there to solve problems and to fix problems, to put out fires and in a calm manner. There's uh, always be another day, right. <laughs> another sunny day. <laughs> it's not stormy all the We have a lot of storms these days, but they come and go. So. <laughs> right. So thank you. It's always a sunny day, yeah. Thank so you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Hamdi. This is lovely. You.